Good afternoon, friends, and thank you for joining us uh, for this uh, opening reception of Dave Thune's Love is Love. It's uh, such a, a great pleasure to uh, have made this exhibition happen. Uh, I think we initially started talking about it maybe three years ago. Yeah, something like that. And then Pre-COVID. Yes, this little pandemic thing happened. But it seems that, you know, things in the universe may work out for a reason, because as it happens, uh, this is the 50th anniversary of your uh, exhibit at the Fargo Gallery. Well, that's true. It yeah. is. Yeah. Wow. Well. So, Absolutely. I didn't think of that. We had uh, an opening. I, uh, I don't know how many of you were here back in this May. Uh, our collections coordinator, Courtney Donahue, had her first uh, solo exhibit here at the Rourke. And at that time, I, I thought about uh, this longstanding tradition of young artists working at the Rourke and uh, getting their start here as artists. And Courtney's exhibit represented something of a renewal of that. And with uh, Dave's uh, anniversary, we see uh, uh, the proud continuation of that. So uh, it, it is my distinct pleasure to give you all <laughs> David Thun. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I didn't used to need reading glasses when I when I first worked at the gallery, I started, I started working, uh, well, I'll get into that as I talk more about this, but um, welcome. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, I grew up in a family that, uh, that loved art. My dad uh, was a second generation, was a second generation photographer. My mother, Fran, uh, was a photo oil colorist and retoucher uh, at the studio and later went on to get her master, her degree in art from MSU and her master's in art therapy from Goddard College. Let's see, you know, going way back, my mom and Dolores Olson, who's here tonight, or this afternoon, took me to my first art exhibit, which was the opening of the brand new Rourke Gallery downtown. I was 10 and, and that was sort of, was the beginning of everything. I was always encouraged to draw. Uh, I usually on paper, but often on the walls and treasured family books, uh, furniture, things like that, stuff that young artists always do. Uh, but that I was never dissuaded from doing that. Now, back in high school, my friend, good friend Charlie Thistle and I used to amuse our fellow uh, students by drawing caricatures, funny pictures of the teachers, things like that. But as time moved on and we became older, uh, things got a little darker. We started doing posters and slogans and, and picket signs opposing the war in Vietnam. It, uh, in fact, at one time, Charlie, myself, and a good friend of ours, Tim Murphy, locked ourselves in the principal's office. Uh, we were ostensibly to read the Pledge of Allegiance, but actually we read a diatribe against the war in Vietnam. And you know, when we were unlocked and severely reprimanded and told it would be a black mark on our records, we you know, chased, we went back to uh, our classes and, and sort of the heroes of the, of the bunch at that point. <laughs> Later on that year, Charlie asked me if, I was, if I'd be interested in a part-time job uh, working at the Work Gallery. Uh, he was headed off to art school the next year in Minneapolis and was assigned to, to find his replacement. Uh, the next day, well, actually that night, I showed up at the gallery on 4th Street, 523 4th Street, uh, to apply. And the doors were locked, but I could see through the, through, between the drapes and through the window these glowing uh, neon sculptures of William Land Weir. And I could hear the Jefferson Airplane, cue the Jefferson Airplane, please. <laughs> we had a plane around here. Uh, I could hear that. And even though the door was locked and I had to leave and come back, I knew I needed to work there. So the next morning I showed up again 
and uh, uh, I'm not I'm not too good at doing these things yet. But uh, Jim hired me on the spot and put me to work immediately learning the the elaborate uh, details of opening and closing the gallery, shutting the drapes just so so there's this much overlap. Uh, bringing the affectionately known as the beast, a big uh, welded steel sculpture of an, some sort of an animal done by Terry Larson from indoor to the gallery to set it on the pedestal outside and then the back again. At the end of the end of the day, covering Jacob's coat, which is a beautiful piece of furniture. I don't know if you still have it or not, uh, but you know, just you know, classic design but covering it with towels because we had two gallery cats, Tiapolo and El Greco, and they would sleep on it at night if, if it weren't covered. It would be full of fur and, and kneading marks from their claws if we weren't careful. Uh, my favorite was, though, that uh, opening and closing the love chest, the William Landweir love chest, which is upstairs still. And we had to close that because same thing. The cats loved to fall asleep on it because of the humming and the warmth of the of the neon tubes. Now, aside from, uh, let's see, this gets me to one of the points of what I'm talking about. The gallery is where I met and listened over coffee to Robert Nelson, George Pfeiffer, Jack Youngquist, Jim Verdorn, gallery artists, and of course, Jim O'Rourke, who is always willing to talk about art history the philosophy of life, and the creation of art. And I tried to absorb it like a sponge. There were three bits of wisdom that I learned in those days that I try to impart to young artists. And from Jim, art should be lived. And secondly, art needs to be every time. And from Robert Nelson, do a drawing a day and a painting a week, and then you can call yourself an artist. And I've always remembered those, and I try to share those with young people. Now, no one can deny that Jim lived art. I got to that a little bit early, but that's okay. Uh, from his paintings and woodcuts to his taste in Harris tweed suits, Jim immersed himself in a love of architecture, classic furnishings, music, Genza flatware, Bavarian china, and of course the collection of art of all kinds. And as I worked at the gallery, it was impossible not to catch that affliction. Now, aside from her natural charm, my girlfriend, Sue, who was a model and a work of art in her own right. She's sitting right here. She's embarrassed. Uh, she sewed flags for, for gallery artists. She sewed my flag, which is right above you, for my show. And uh, of course, she wore fetching outfits, leather hot pants, a great purple maxi coat, and other things that she sewed herself from Vogue patterns. And uh, Jim welcomed her. She was, he always was really pleased when, when Sue showed up at the openings and things. And then she'd help me wash wine glasses at the end of the night. But I knew she had fallen for me, not because of my scholarliness at school or the fact that I was an older, more suave and, and sophisticated uh, upperclassman at, at school. I was 16 and she was 15. But because I was an up-and-coming rock and roll star. Now that's, that's me up there on the far left in junior high school painting the drum head uh, for our band, The Gentle Egg. It was back in the psychedelic days. And unfortunately, the peak of my career never really amounted to that much. But in 2008, I was on stage right there where the, where the arrow is uh, playing, uh, I think we were playing White Rabbit at the time, Jefferson Airplane tune. Unfortunately, I found out that Sue really didn't uh, care for me because I was a rock star, but because my parents had a lake cabin. <laughs> but I have my dreams. Now, J Jim not only was uh, not only approved uh, when I told him that I was going to ask Sue to marry me, but uh, he he was really really encouraging me to do it and do it right. And the first thing he did was volunteer to do a woodcut of uh, St. Mary's Cathedral, where we were married. And that's us down on the right below the steps. And interestingly, it's one of the very few uh, pieces of art that Jim ever did that had people in them. He told me once he, just, he just couldn't draw people. 
which, you know, kind of stunned me. I thought all artists are people, but Jim was very frank. He couldn't draw people. He did one of Steve Cawthon on a racehorse and another one that Jonathan told me about the other day, but not very, mu not very many. Uh, also, uh, we had a friend of ours, uh, Terry Larson, did a welded steel sculpture, Dave and Sue Get Married, which is actually the top of the, of the topper for the wedding cake. And the, the, the nice lady that did our wedding cake wouldn't put it on the wedding cake and insisted that we buy a plastic uh, couple to, to put on as it left her home and headed to the, uh, to the YMCA where we had our reception. But... Uh, when she left, we put it on top of the cake. Yeah, we took off the plastic sculpture and put this back on the cake. And we still have this, obviously. Uh, for my first one-man show, she, she did make that flag up there, sewed flags for Jim Verdor, and I'm not sure if she sewed that gallery flag or not, because that's not an, that's not an original 1968 version. Uh, she may have, I, I'm not sure. She doesn't remember. Uh, now, emblematic of our life, lived in art uh, for our 48th wedding anniversary. Uh, Sue presented me with a wonderful uh, piece of art by Brock and Rourke, uh, which has a, a gallery symbol embedded in the thing. And that was, that was really special. special. Um, in City Hall, oops, there we go. I didn't mention, but I got into politics shortly after we moved uh, from from St. Paul, or from Moorhead to the Twin Cities. In City Hall, I used to drive the management of the, of the historic uh, courthouse to near madness by constantly nailing picture hanging hooks in the, wall, in the historic walls to hang original art, which uh, I thought was just a normal thing, but apparently it, it wasn't normally that normal. Um, let's see here. I did decorate my office with, with original art uh, and, and well, one of the classic things, we had a classic uh, uh, Seberg uh, jukebox that I installed in the, in the courthouse and invited all the maintenance workers to come in at night and have their lunch uh, or dinner at 10 o'clock at night and, and uh, play the jukebox and eat their dinner, which kind of endeared me to them. Now, I'll explain a little bit about this. Chris, there's Sue's purple maxi coat in black and white, and she was fetching. It still is fetching. Uh, when I ran for office, it was a family affair. Those are three kids down in front, dutifully wearing their Dave Thune T-shirts. Uh, and in the center is probably one of the, I suppose, the highlight of my career when when I introduced and passed our human rights amendment in St. Paul, and that's the victory speech down in the, in the quartile of the, the courthouse. Uh, my opponents and political enemies pronounced it was gonna be the end of my career, and unfortunately for them, I was reelected and inaugurated numerous times and spent 20 years in the city council until I finally retired. That's a photograph in front of my gallery, the St. Paul Gallery. Uh, well, about five, six years ago now, I think. Uh, another high point of my career is you know, latching on early to the Obama campaign. Um, I, in fact, we drove back at breakneck speed from the lake so I could meet him. He was at a campaign stop, and we got to meet, and he, uh, I always remember this, he somehow he reached and took a hold of my tie-dye t-shirt, which I had under my sport coat, and said, nice tie-dye, Dave. You know, we got a Deadheads for Obama fan club. You want to join? I said, you got me. <laughs> so anyway, that... Art needs to be of its time. And that's another thing that Jim, uh, you know, really enforced to me. And my time at that point was, you know, the late 60s, early 70s, um, you know, the days of Andy Warhol, the days of the, the, the conflict in Vietnam. And I took all that to heart. My first painting shown at the gallery was an acrylic on canvas uh, featuring a cartoon American Eagle 
uh, draped in a flag and leaning on a large bomb. Uh, Jim accepted it into the gallery's anniversary show on the 18th of June and encouraged me to explore that cartoon style, that same cartoon style with eagles, flags, and, and which I did. I, I, I started to work, working in painting, uh, usually stretching old screen doors and screen windows, stretching raw canvas over those because I didn't have any money. Jim paid me 60 cents an hour to, to work at the gallery. Remember that, Robert? You weren't paid much more than that either, yeah? Anyway, uh, as I'd produced more and more of the, these eagles, he asked me if I'd like to have a show at this recently opened Fargo Gallery, uh, part of the Verdorn's craft arts movement, which uh, I, I was uh, just tickled to do. Um, I really dived into making, to, to, to working, to making, making the show happen. Uh, completing the show in the nick of time because I had crashed my motorcycle on the way to direct traffic at George McGovern's Whistletop campaign stop at Hector Airport, and I was supposed to direct traffic, but I never got there because I hit a telephone pole, and finished the show on crutches and a full leg cast, which thanks to Sue, who drove me around in our Volkswagen with no, no front seat because I had to sit in the back seat, I and my mother, who actually executed the, the screen print of my poster, uh, I did finish the show. The show is called Come Home America, and it had numerous uh, of these, these paintings of eagles, and I donated the proceeds of any sales to uh, the McGovern campaign. Jim had actually he said, you, you can't just go and sit in a wheelchair. You've you got to have a nice wheelchair. So he, don't, he gave me a wicker wheelchair in antique, and that's what that previous picture was. Yeah. Yeah, I think you see a little bit of it there. But, you know, Jim was all about style, and you had to have style. So Come Home America was the theme. Uh, had numerous you know, depictions of uh, uh, one more peep in all of retaliates, you know, you know, holding a, a, a bird hostage. This one, the silent majority speaks, crossed out, uh, minority clinks, was, was uh, poking fun, not so lightly, at the campaign to reelect the president. This one is actually owned by uh, a fellow who lives in Washington now, and his kids used to play with the, uh, the, the, uh, which kids, the, The Clinton, the Clinton kids. The Clinton daughter. Clinton daughter. Yeah, the daughter. <laughs> Did he? I, I, I don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, also, you know, I took some uh, swipes at racism. This one is actually upstairs. I didn't realize it was in Jim's permanent collection, but step to the back, boy. Uh, on the back, you'll see an elk and, an, and a moose. At that point, the elks and the moose clubs would not allow blacks to, to come to eat there, to become members. So that's, uh, now eventually by then, I was assistant director of the work, and Sue and I moved to St. Paul, uh, which you know was kind of scary, but I became the exhibits coordinator at the Minnesota Historical Society, and Jer Jim encouraged me to, to do that. He said, that's, that's the next logical step for your career. One thing led to another, and George Pfeiffer and I opened the St. Paul Gallery in 1987. And at the same time, I ran for and won a seat on the St. Paul City Council, where I served for 20 years. Uh, this, uh, this is a more recent picture, I think it's a couple years old, of uh, the St. Paul Gallery, which still exists in St. Paul, and its fourth location. You might be able to see a few of the things reminiscent of, of the Rourke design style the burlap color covered panels, neon art, even a century plant. And we've had concerts, we've had shows, uh, the, the classic uh, uh, annual chocolate show, Valentine's and chocolate show that we have, uh, the theme being love and hearts and, and chocolate. So um, as, as we moved, moved on, 
one of the first things I did when I uh, got elected to the St. Paul City Council was introduced, reintroduced an ordinance that would reestablish the city's uh, ordinance uh, guaranteeing human rights to anyone regardless of their, their sexual orientation. Uh, with a, uh, and we had had that law in the past, but it had been rescinded by, by an election. And uh, I, that, was, that was, again, that I mentioned before that speech, uh, probably, well, the biggest test of my career, but it's also the first test. Uh, we introduced it, so we had death threats, we had people picketing, uh, all sorts of mail. In fact, I just bundled up uh, about that much stack of papers and materials, including the, the anonymous uh, letters and nasty cartoons and things that were sent to me. Uh, but it wound up passing, and uh, Love is Love, the show upstairs, is kind of the, the, the general theme that I developed uh, out of that. Uh, and it's the basis of the show. So, trying to end a painting, painting a week. Again, what Robert Nelson just tried to drill into me, but I tried to drill into other people. You, to make art and be an artist, you have to keep being an artist. You can't just, you know, sort of leisurely paint on a Sunday afternoon. You really need to throw yourself into it. And I, I've kept on task. I've never quite done a painting a week or a completed piece of art a week. That's, that's a pretty high bar. Robert Nelson does it, or just did it until he just passed away this year. Um, I've explored painting, drawing, and printmaking. Uh, at one point, I, when we were out of money, I started doing drawings of historic buildings in St. Paul, the cathedral, the landmark center, uh, the other landmarks and things, and then converting those into sepia prints which, uh, again, a technique I learned in architecture school. Uh, I think I own the last living blueprint machine in the world, <laughs> which is down in my basement. But sepia prints were this nice, nice brownish color, uh, and a, the, using the, the print technique is something that Jack Youngquist used to do. And of course, my love of uh, historic architecture I learned from another than our, our local historian master, uh, Ron Ramsey here. Who, uh, your, your lecture, your talk is next week? Thursday. Thursday, this Thursday. Don't miss it. So anyway, I used to make these, I made these uh, sepia prints and went around in a satchel and went from law firm to, to bank to nonprofit, you know, hawking them on the streets and, and selling uh, framed photo or drawings of historic buildings. And, uh, you know, basically, you know, made a few bucks on the side and kept the wolf from the door. <clears throat> now, we get down to what we've got upstairs. The process that, that I've used here is something that I happened on when uh, I was putting letters on the front of the gallery, with vinyl letters saying St. Paul Gallery. And uh, I had someone else had cut the things and we peel them off and apply them to the glass and squeegee them out to make them stick. And I thought, geez, you know, I could make art out of this. And so I started to experiment a little bit and uh, discovered that it really is really a fun process, but I'd always liked the two-dimensional aspect of the 60s. My life seems to go back to the 60s as if it started there. but. Uh, uh, the, the pop art movement and the flatness of uh, soft screen. And I thought, you know, this has a lot of that same feel, a new technique, but still that same two-dimensional feel. So I started uh, doing these, these uh, pieces and, and, you know, I'm kind of inclined to do uh, uh, figurative things, but uh, kind of as, you know, like Andy Warhol, I very often take other images that I'd seen elsewhere, public domain things, and then alter them. The process is something where I'd either do a drawing or take something else that's scanned and then redraw it and uh, rework it in the computer uh, because you need to cut it down to only two, two colors. And uh, then the computer sends the, the piece to a, a machine that's kind of like a drum plotter, but it uh, is a tiny blade that cuts through the vinyl. You weed away the, the white areas or the negative spaces and then 
reapply that on the glass. And uh, I think it really turned out to be a fun technique. And the added bonus is the transparency of the glass so you can see the shadow on the back or wherever you wind, wind up hanging it. Uh, so they're not Campbell's soup cans and not images of Jackie Kennedy, but uh, depictions of seam nylons, which you know I kind of like. Uh, a couple of people have mentioned they, they didn't like wearing them. I don't wear them, I like looking at them. But uh, who doesn't like seam nylons is the name of that, that piece. And then I started doing a few other things, and again, in keeping with uh, you know, my general political philosophy that love is love. And uh, when, when we uh, finally passed the, the marriage uh, ordinances in St. Paul and the state finally, and then the federal government, um, it, it's still a struggle for people. But, but you know, I like to emphasize and reemphasize that love, in fact, is love. And it's something in art that I, I uh, you know, like to reemphasize. Done a few other things. Again, taking a, uh, you know, a, an iconic uh, sculpture and reworking that. Uh, More than friends, or Matahari, who was uh, a lot of my a lot of my stuff has sort of a sensual idea, gentle eroticism. I call it uh, nothing. And then you know, blatantly uh, political. Nevertheless, she persisted. A quote by the the famous celebrated Mitch McConnell uh, talking about a political adversary that just wouldn't give up the floor and the Senate floor. So nevertheless, she persisted uh, taking the Delacroix, uh, uh, liberty leading the people, converting that to a rainbow flag and using the radical symbol of revolution, the, the cats down the front. Uh, that, that gets to be a fairly complex piece, and and uh, and it's fairly fairly difficult to make that one. So anyway, all this has moved me into uh, changing, uh, going from the very basics of reproducing a uh, Hershey's Kiss upstairs, which I still like those, or lips, the things a little more complex. Since then, I've also started uh, doing. Uh, uh, polyester plate lithography on, on actually on Phil Thompson's uh, press, which he, once he stopped making prints, he sold it to me. And it's a 48 or 50 inch long press. And so I'm relearning my old college uh, techniques of how to, how to do lithographs. Uh, and I've started applying those inside of a, a piece. Um, and even now I'm moving just to straight lithography, like the piece right back there in the, in the show. The, uh, showing Leah pulled by her two uh, sturdy cats over, over the fields uh, after a, a battle. So that's, uh, it's, it's been great fun. I've uh, tried to explore finding new techniques, trying to make lots and lots of art. I was pretty much forced to it uh, uh, during the COVID and the riots up in St. Paul when, and West 7th Street where my gallery was. Is, in the heart of some of the rioting. Uh, we had to cover the, the windows with plywood and basically shut down because of COVID for about a year. So again, reminiscent of what did you do during your summer vacation? What did you do during COVID? Well, I made art. So thinking about Robert Nelson, I, I did in fact finally produce at least a drawing a day and for sure a piece of finished piece of art a week, which I was to hang at the show at my gallery, which never, happened because of the COVID, we couldn't finish the show. And finally, like, uh, you know, completing a circle, I was just tickled when Jonathan asked me if I'd be interested in having the show here, because the Rourke is where I, I started making art, where I started learning about art. Uh, and I guess, you know, it's, it's great coming home. So I hope uh, that, uh, that you all, and I, I would, would hope that, uh, if Robert Nelson were alive, he'd still be proud of the fact that I made a bunch of art. And Jim would be proud of the fact that, uh, we've, that Sue and I and our family have always lived art. And I hope you all get a chance to take a look at the pieces upstairs and enjoy yourself. So thank you very much. Art should be lived. Uh, 
uh, and love is love. So thank you for coming. I don't know. Thank you. I don't, I don't know if you all have any questions. You, know, you can either ask me right here on the spot, or you, you could always you know, catch me later, too. Robert? Yes? I remember once I was staying with Robert Bolton overnight up in Grand Forks and sitting at the breakfast table with him. You know, I'm washing down. He's dry. And by the time I finish breakfast, with his finished drawing called Eat. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's, that's great. That's great. That's, 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 that's wonderful. You know, Nelson was great about just like making, making art like every waking second, like he said, at breakfast. Um, I, of course, went on Facebook with his, his widow now, and she would always be posting photographs of, here's Robert, you know, he's 92 or whatever, whatever. I can't remember how old he was, he was in his 90s. He was still making art. His last show, he did a piece about as big as that screen you know, complicated, complex, but at that age, still making art. Uh, and he also did things like with lithography, like uh, a hand, particularly when that, that shape right there, and then making a, a, a print and cutting it out and putting on cardboard or something. And that, that same hand would show up in different paintings and different other pieces that he had. So again, I love that technique, and, and so you probably see more of me doing that sort of thing. Any other interesting observations? Dave, Sir. Um, when you and Charlie were collaborating, did you see where Charlie was going to eventually end up as you know, a tremendous painter? Well, I knew he was going to be an artist. I mean, we, uh, you know, both of us, like I say, we, we loved uh, drawing and letting other people see it. He was a musician too. I don't know if you noticed that photograph of him sitting in a great chair in front of the, the gallery on 4th Street. It was one photograph by Winfield Johnson. And you can see carefully he's holding Tiepolo, the cat. Uh, but it was also advertised at a concert that he did. Uh, he used to do solo uh, folk guitar concerts himself and then sometimes with another friend, uh, Dakota Dave Hull, who wasn't officially known as Dakota Dave Hall, as in uh, the, the TV and radio. Uh, what? Prairie Home Companion. Yeah, Prairie, yeah. I mean, he was on the Prairie Home Companion line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, Charlie and I, you know, uh, loved art and, and loved making art. Uh, I don't think any of us actually imagined, you know, where we'd be 50 years later, but uh, we all knew that Charlie was extremely talented. You know, you knew him uh, back we in those. We were in uh, New Orleans for a city convention, and we were just looking at the gallery windows, and I said, that's a Charlie Heisel. Yeah. And sure enough, it was. It was full of it. They had a bunch of his stuff there. So anyway, I, uh, in closing, thank you everybody who's pushed me, prodded me, taught me, uh, learned me, uh, tolerated me, and, and it's great being back here. <laughs> Be sure to go up and see the show. You have a degree in architecture. I do have a degree in architecture. Did it Thanks. make a difference? <laughs> The, per the, perser the perseverance, yeah, yeah, it's true. I actually built my house <laughs> because it was an old house. But uh, yeah, I, my architecture degree did make a difference when ex the experience. I, if nothing else, learning to stay up all night doing work uh, really did make a difference. And actually, uh, I've shared this with Ron, but the reason I have a degree, because I, I kept flunking chemistry and physics, because they were in these classrooms of 90 people and I couldn't hear and I'd wind up sleeping because I'd been up chasing Sue all day the night or all night the night before. And I just couldn't pass those things. I was short one credit to graduate. And so I went to Ron, who I never took a history class from because he came on after I'd started school already, and said, can I do a special topics you know, class? 
He said, sure, Dave. And so we thought of a topic, and, and he gave me an A before I'd actually completed it, got that turned into the dean, and I had enough credits to graduate. So, Ron, thank you very much. <laughs> because of, you have my five-year Bachelor of Architecture. One credit should not stand between <laughs> you and success. There we go. So, thank you.